Tonight we're going to continue our study on the manifestation gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. And the reason I continue to give you that passage of Scripture is because I'm hoping you're going to log it in. You know, the manifestation gifts are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the motivational gifts are in Romans chapter 12, and the ministry gifts are in Ephesians chapter 4. And those are just nice things to have uh, in your mind because there are times when people will ask you questions as to what you believe. And it's always nice to be able to go to the passage of Scripture in which they're talking about it. So I continue to give that to you, hoping that you'll log it in. Now, last week we started on the gift of prophecy, and I'm emphasizing the word started because we still have another week to go, maybe two, on the gift of prophecy, depending upon how in-depth I really want to go. I'm not sure. I might even spend four or five weeks on it. There's just so much material when it comes to the subject of prophecy. Now, as I told you last week, the gift of prophecy is probably the most misunderstood gift. In fact, there are more misconceptions concerning prophecy than any of the other gifts. But that's because most people have an Old Testament concept of prophecy and prophets. You see, most people don't know that there's a difference between the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet. Or that there's a difference between Old Testament prophecy and New Testament prophecy. You see, the New Testament prophet's role and function is different than the Old Testament prophet's. In other words, the New Testament prophet doesn't operate in the same capacity as the Old Testament prophet. And if you don't know that, you're in trouble. Especially if you grew up in a mainline denominational church. Now, how many of you knew that before last week? Anyone? How many of you didn't know that until last week? Okay, that's good to know. Well, don't feel bad because, as I said last week, most professors in our seminaries don't know what I shared with you last week or what I'm going to share with you tonight. And I can guarantee you that the majority of pastors, probably 99% of pastors, don't know what I'm going to show you tonight. But that's why I'm spending so much time on this gift. Now, last week we studied the Old Testament prophet, and what we found was that the Old Testament prophet was infallible. And the reason he was infallible was because when he prophesied, he went into an open-eyed trance. And God literally put his words into the mouth of the prophet. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Numbers, chapter 24. We're going to read verses 2, 4, and 16, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Notice what verse number 2 says. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to the tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him. Now that's very important, because the majority of the time when it's talking about a prophet having a vision, it will say that almost in the exact words. Now it doesn't say it all the time, or our Bible wouldn't be this thick, it would be this thick. It mentions it once, it moves on. But this is one of those phrases that it says quite often when it's talking about a prophet because he, the Bible wants you to get it, that the Holy Spirit would come up on these prophets, literally possess them at the time they would prophesy, and they would go into what is known as an open-eyed trance. Look at verse 4. He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Now, if you notice, it it has into a trance is italicized, which means it's not there, but the word falling is there. And literally what it means in the Hebrew is what it says, falling into a trance but having his eyes open. Now, look at verse number 16. He hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance but having his eyes open. And this is how God ensured that no prophet ever added to or took away from the Lord's message, that prophetic message. The prophet spoke word for word God's message because God was putting his words into the prophet's mouth while he was in this trance. But this is also why if a prophet ever prophesied something that didn't come to pass, you knew that he was a false prophet because God's never wrong. And God knows the future. In fact, I've taught on this many times before, but I'll just mention it now. God has what scholars refer to as middle knowledge. Now, what do we mean by middle knowledge? It means that God doesn't doesn't just know what's going to happen in the future. He knows what could happen in every possible situation. You see, some people have a hard time with the fact that God knows the future, and yet God's given us a free will. 
Well, if God's given us a free will, how does he know the future? It's because God possesses what is known as middle knowledge. He not only knows what will happen in the future, he knows what could happen in every possible situation. That's how powerful and almighty that God is. So, if a person was a true prophet of God, he never made a mistake. Because as I've said, when an Old Testament prophet prophesied, the Holy Spirit would come upon him, take control of him. He'd go into an open-eyed trance, and God would put his words into the mouth of the prophet, which means that it was God speaking, not the man. And people, God doesn't make mistakes. So a true Old Testament prophet was infallible. And that was the test of a true prophet. Notice what Moses wrote in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 20 through 22. But any prophet who falsely claims to speak in my name or who speaks in the name of another God must die. What was the penalty? The penalty was they were stoned. But you may wonder, well, how will we know whether or not a prophecy is from the Lord? If the prophet speaks in the Lord's name but his prediction does not happen or come true, you will know that the Lord did not give that message. That prophet has spoken without my authority and he need not be feared. In other words... Don't be afraid of them. Now, what about the New Testament prophet? Does the New Testament prophet have the same infallibility? No. And let me prove it to you. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and let's read verses 29 through 32. Notice what it says. Paul is giving the rules or the guidelines for how the gifts are supposed to operate in the church. You know, many times people come up to me, I'm going to get off for just a second, will come up to me and say, do you believe in the gifts? Yes, we do. Well, why aren't you like all the other charismatic churches? Well, the reason we're not is because we believe that we're supposed to follow the guidelines that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. And this is a portion of the guidelines. Recognize that as we read this. Verses 29 through 32, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the others judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy, one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted, and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now I want you to underline the word judge in verse number 29. It says, let the prophets speak two or three and let the others judge. Now the word judge is translated from the Greek word diakrino. Dia crino. And dia crino is a compound word. That simply means that it's made up of more than one word. Literally, it could be made up of four words. Normally, it's not. I was talking to a person the other day, and he said, so a compound word is a word that's made up of two words. I said, not necessarily so. A compound word simply means it's made up of more than one word. Now, in this case, it's made up of two words. It's made up of the root word crino, which means to judge. And it's made up of the prefix dia, which in this context means through. Now, when you combine those two words, it literally means, and if you're taking notes, you should write this down so that you can explain to people what prophecy is. But notice what it says. It literally means to separate one item from another and judge them separately. So what this is saying, what Paul was trying to say, is that a prophecy can have different parts to it, and each part is to be judged separately. In other words, some parts of a prophecy are true, and other parts are false sometimes when it comes to New Testament prophecy. But each part is to be judged separately in order to make a determination. Is that right or is that wrong? Now people, you didn't do that with Old Testament prophecies. In the Old Testament, prophecies were judged as a whole. And if one part of the prophecy was wrong, then all of it was wrong. Man, you could prophesy for an hour, and if if 59 minutes and 59 seconds of that prophecy was right on, but one second of it was wrong, then it was all wrong. Why? Because again... The capacity in which the Old Testament prophet prophesied. The Holy Spirit came upon him, took control of him. He went into an open-eyed trance. God placed his words into the prophet's mouth, and he only spoke what God put in his mouth. But it's not that way in the New Testament. So that's the first difference between New Testament prophecy and Old Testament prophecy. In the Old Testament, if part of the prophecy was wrong, it was all wrong. In the New Testament prophecy... 
One part can be true and another part false. But each part was supposed to be judged separately. The second thing that I want you to notice about New Testament prophecy is found in verse number 30. It says, let the prophet speak two or three and let the others judge. And it implies, if you know Greek, each part. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that you may all learn and all may be comforted. In other words, if one prophet is prophesying and another person receives a revelation, the one who is speaking is supposed to wrap it up and sit down so that the other one can speak, or in other words, prophesy. Yeah. In fact, let me read this passage of Scripture from the New Living Translation. I want you to notice how it does it. It's really a good translation. What I said was wrong. It's really, the New Living Translation is not a translation, it's an interpretation. In fact, I hate to burst your bubble, but the NIV is an interpretation too. The King James Version, the New American Standard, different ones are literally translations. They're literally translating it. But in certain of our translations, we just call them translations. But basically, what we do is we look at that and say, well, this is what it means. Now, let me interpret it a little bit so I can make it clearer. And the New Living Translation is like that. But it's very close. So let me read this passage of Scripture from the New Living Translation, if you don't mind. Let two or three people prophesy, and let the others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying, another person receives a revelation from the Lord. The one who is speaking must stop. The one who is speaking must stop. The one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak, one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. Now, people, I want you to think about this. If a New Testament prophet operated in the same capacity as an Old Testament prophet, that would mean that when he prophesied, he would go into an open-eyed trance, and God would be putting his words into the mouth of the prophet, and the Holy Spirit would be in control of him. So, if that's the case, and it's not, but if it was, would he be able to stop prophesying on his own? Think about that. If he prophesied in the same capacity as the Old Testament prophet, who, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, took control of him, he went into an open-eyed trance, God put his words into the mouth of the prophet so he could speak, as Balaam said unto Balak, only what the Lord puts into my mouth. Now, if the New Testament prophet prophesied in the same capacity, in the same way, if if the Holy Spirit came upon him, And possessed him. He went into an open-eyed trance. God put his words into the mouth of the prophet. Could he stop it at his own will? No. Would he be able to wrap it up and sit down so the next guy who's received a revelation could speak? No. And would God even allow that? No way. In fact, if a person was in an open-eyed trance and he was speaking word for word a message of the Lord, you wouldn't dare cut him short. Hey, that's God speaking. We need to hear every single word of it. What do you mean, stop and wrap it up? That's God speaking, right? Are you with me or not? So, that's the second difference between an Old Testament prophet and a New Testament prophet. When an Old Testament prophet prophesied, the Holy Spirit came upon him and took control of him. And he literally went into this open-eyed trance and he couldn't stop it. Now let me prove that to you. Look with me if you would in 1 Samuel chapter 19. We're going to read verses 19 through 24 and you'll see what I'm talking about. In fact, we're going to use someone that's not a prophet, but something happened to him that happened to the prophets. And I want you to notice how it affected him. And we're talking about King Saul. Remember that King Saul became very jealous of David and because of that he wanted to kill David. And so it literally came to the place where for 14 years David was on the run from Saul. And I mean... Saul used every resource he had. He used his entire army to try and hunt David down to kill him. And this is where we pick it up. 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 19. When the report reached Saul that David was at Naoth and Ramah, he sent troops to capture him. But when the troops arrived and saw Samuel leading a group of prophets who were prophesying, the Spirit of God came upon Saul's men, and they also began to prophesy. They stopped the chase. 
Now, people, they were under direct orders. But the Spirit of God came upon them. They stopped chasing David, and they began to prophesy. Let's continue on. When Saul heard what had happened, let's read between the lines, he got upset with the men. He sent other troops, but they too prophesied. The same thing happened a third time. Finally, Saul himself went to Ramah and arrived at the great well in Sikhu. Where, where are Samuel and David, he demanded. They are at Naoth and Ramah, someone told him. But on the way to Naoth and Ramah, the Spirit of God came even upon Saul, and he too began to prophesy all the way to Naoth. He tore off his clothes and lay naked. Now you need to understand because when you read some of the prophets, it will talk about them being naked and lying naked. And you go, oh, you mean they showed everything? No. What that meant was they had their undergarments on, but the outer garments were off. Don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. God is a God of decency, but you have to understand the culture. If they would see someone in their undergarments at that time, they were naked. And someone's going to come up to me and say, Alan, the correct way to pronounce that is naked. No, it's not. Naked is dirty. Naked is innocent. You see a little baby and they have this picture and they're naked. They're naked as a jaybird. That means it's innocent. Someone takes their clothes off and it's dirty. They're naked. Anyways, I want you to understand. So anyways, he lay naked on the ground all day and all night prophesying in the presence of Samuel. The people who were watching exclaimed, what? Is even Saul a prophet? Now people, do you see that? When the Spirit of God came upon Saul, he began to prophesy, and he couldn't stop it. People, he wanted to chase David. That's why he sent the troops down there. When the first group of troops started prophesying and they didn't chase David, he got upset. He sent a second one. The Spirit of God came upon them. They stopped everything they were doing. They couldn't help it. They started prophesying. He sends a third one. Finally, he's fed up. He's the only one that can resist this. He gets down there. The Spirit of God comes upon him. And the next thing he knows, he's laying on the ground, naked, prophesying. People, he couldn't stop it. Now, in the New Testament, a prophet has the ability to stop prophesying at will. In fact, that's what Paul commanded the prophets to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 at a service. And he says, if one's prophesying and another receives a revelation from the Lord, then you need to wrap it up and you need to sit down and you need to let the other guy speak. People, that didn't happen in the Old Testament because you couldn't stop it. Why? Because you're in a trance. Which is, which brings us to the third difference. Look at verse number 32 again. In fact, what I want to do is I want to read the whole passage of Scripture again, and then we're going to focus in on the last verse, verse 32. Let two or three people prophesy, and let the others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying, another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop, not should stop. You're in control. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak, one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that the people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. Now, if you're like me, I like the King James Version. I grew up on the King James Version. The King James Version makes sense to me. It took Lisa years to convince me that most people don't like the King James Version, when I put scripture up here, use the NIV, the New American Standard. But people, I memorized all the scripture in the King James Version. It makes perfect sense to me. And if you're like me, here's what the King James Version says. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. But people, that means the very same thing. It means that in the New Testament, the perfect person who's prophesying can control it because they're in control of their spirit. But people, that wasn't true for the Old Testament prophet. He couldn't control his spirit when he went into an open-eyed trance. People, he was in a trance. And that's what Balaam was trying to tell Balak. If you remember, Balak sees the children of Israel coming in and he realizes, man, God is with them. But I, I know a guy who's a, a, who is a prophet. Everything that he prophesies comes to pass. 
So he sends a message to Balaam. He says, if you'll come prophesy against them, if you'll place a curse on them, I'll give you lots of money. And Balaam tries to tell Balaam, you don't understand. That's not how it works. The way it works is that when it's time to prophesy, the Spirit of God comes upon me. He takes control of me. I go into a trance. He puts his words into my mouth, and I can't help but speak what the Lord gives me. Notice what it says in Numbers 24.4. He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, fall into a trance, but having his eyes open. That's what he was trying to tell Balak. You don't get it. I can't control it. Not when the Spirit of God comes upon me. I'm now in a trance. I can't stop it. I can't start it. It's based upon God. Now, how many of you know the rest of the story? The rest of the story is this. I can't prophesy against them but I really want your money. So now that the Spirit of God's not upon me and I'm not prophesying, let me tell you how you can make God mad at them and God will curse them. You just get your cute little women to go down there and you allow them to worship their God with those cute little women because they believed in what was known as imitation magic. In other words, you stimulated the gods by, ha by conducting sexual acts because they were voyeurs, the gods were. And supposedly when they watched uh, these people having sex, it would turn them on, the gods would have sex, and the earth would be fertile. And so what Balaam did and why God was so mad at him is that no, he couldn't curse them in a prophecy, but he gave him counsel on how to make God mad at him. You remember the story? Okay, if you didn't, that's the story. So as you can see, there's a huge difference between New Testament prophets and Old Testament prophets and between New Testament prophecy and Old Testament prophecy. Listen to me. They are not the same. Now, why do I bring this up? Because every once in a while, you'll find someone who operates in the spiritual gift of prophecy and they act like they're an Old Testament prophet. Touch not God's anointed when I speak. It's God speaking. People, it's not the same. But they have an Old Testament concept of New Testament prophecy and prophets. Now, let me give you an example, a biblical example, that shows that New Testament prophets are fallible, and then I'll explain why they're fallible. Are you guys with me? People, this is good stuff. You won't get this, even in Bible college. I'm not trying to be arrogant, but I'm here to tell you the majority of Bible college don't believe in the gifts, so they're not even going to touch them. The first uh, exegetical critical commentary that I had to write was basically supposedly to disprove that uh, tongues weren't supposed to be in operation anymore, that they'd ceased at the end of the apostolic age because that's the type of Bible college that I went to. They didn't believe in the gifts. Man. I did exactly what they told me to do, and I came to the conclusion that you guys don't know what you're talking about. Got an A on the paper. They were very good professors. I loved them dearly, but they didn't believe in the gifts. So the majority of the time, if you go to these Bible colleges, there's seminaries, they're not going to teach on the gifts. So let me give you an example that shows that New Testament prophets are fallible. Remember, Old Testament prophets are infallible. New Testament prophets are fallible. Turn to Acts chapter 21. And while you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background information that you need to know. Luke, who's the author of Acts, is a historian. And as a historian, he wanted accuracy more than anything else. So whenever he was writing, so when he was writing the book of Acts, after every fulfillment of some type of prophecy, he would always write, and it came to pass. In fact, let me give an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 28. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted. In other words, he prophesied that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world and it came to pass during the reign of Claudius. Do you see that? Luke first recorded the prophecy and then he recorded and it came to pass. Why? Because he wanted you to understand that this was prophesied and to be accurate, it came to pass. Luke's a historian, and he does that. Now, in Acts chapter 21, 
Paul was determined to go to Jerusalem. Most of you know the story. You've read the book of Acts. Paul decides, I'm going to Jerusalem. But the disciples re received a revelation from God, and they prophesied to Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And in verses 10 and 11, in chapter number 21, the prophet Agabus, the same prophet who prophesied that a famine was going to come upon all of the Roman world, that same prophet, the prophet Agabus came to Paul, and he bound his feet, and he bound his hands, and this is what he said. And you'll find this in verses 10 and 11, if you want to write that down and go back and read it. I'm just telling you what he prophesied. The Jews will bind your feet and hands and deliver you over to the Gentiles. And the implication is, if you go. That's what Agabus prophesied to Paul. Now, let's turn to Acts chapter 21. Remember, that's verses 10 and 11. Now let's read verses 29 through 36 because this is the fulfillment of what Agabus prophesied. Agabus came to Paul. He bound his feet. He bound his hands. He said, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. The Jews will bind your hands and feet, and they will turn you over to the Romans. So we go down a little bit further in the chapter, and we see the fulfillment. Let's look at it. For earlier that day, they had seen Paul in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed that Paul had taken him into the temple. The whole city was rocked by these accusations. You know how it begins to go through. Everyone starts talking about it. Paul has taken a Gentile past the court of the Gentiles into the court of the Gentile, or past the court of the Gentile, into the court of the women. That's where he supposedly had taken him. The whole city was rocked by these accusations, and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed, and he was dragged out of the temple. And it doesn't mean he was dragged out of the court of the Gentiles. It means he was dragged out of the court of the women. So he's dragged out into the court of the Gentiles. And if you remember, the Romans actually had a place where they could overlook the temple. And the reason they wanted to overlook it is because if anything was going to happen during one of the holy days, it was going to happen there. Because the Jews were very hot-headed. So they grab Paul and they drag him out of the court of the women. And immediately the gates were closed behind him. And they were trying to kill him. Word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and they ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. Literally, they were going to beat him to death. That's what they wanted to do. Then the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains. Why two chains? One for his feet, one for his hands. Agabus prophesied that. He asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some another. Since he couldn't find out the truth in the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress, Antonio's fortress. That's the fortress the soldiers were in that they could overlook the temple mount. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent. Why? Because they did not want to turn him over to the Romans. They wanted to kill him. They grew so violent that the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him. In other words, they couldn't just carry him. In order to get him away from the people, literally, they had to lift him up. They had to hold him over their high hands. And they had to take him up the stairs while people were trying to grab at him. And the crowd followed behind shouting, kill him, kill him. Now here's what's interesting. When you read the story, the first thing you notice is that Luke didn't write, and it came to pass. Now wait a minute. He told us what Agabus prophesied in verses 10 and 11 in the very same chapter. We read on down, and we come to where it's fulfilled. And yet Luke doesn't do what he's always done before. He doesn't say... And it came to pass. Why? Because it didn't come to pass. At least not in the way that Agabus said that it would. Look at verses 33 and 35. It says, Then the commander, the commander of the Roman soldiers, arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains, one for his feet, one for his hands. He asked the crowd who, uh, who he was and what he had done. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent, the soldiers had to lift him to the soldiers to protect him because the Jews didn't want to turn him over to the Romans. Now, hopefully you see that there are two errors in this prophecy. First of all, the Romans bound him, not the Jews. If you remember when Agabus was prophesying, he says, said, the Jews will bind your hands and your feet. The Jews did not bind him. The Romans did. So that's error number one. 
Secondly, the Romans took him from the Jews. The Jews did not turn him over. If you remember, when Agabus was prophesying, he said, the Jews will turn you over to the Romans. They did not turn him over to the Romans. In fact, they wanted to take him from the Romans because they wanted to kill him. So that's error number two. Now, an Old Testament prophet would have been stoned for those two simple mistakes. Because if, anything's, if one thing is wrong in the prophecy, then it's all wrong. He's not a true prophet, therefore he must die. So an Old Testament prophet would have been stoned for making those two mistakes. But we're no longer in the dispensation of law. We're in the dispensation of grace. So this occurred in a new dispensation. And in this new dispensation, this dispensation of grace, the fallibility of God's word is no longer at stake. Remember, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the Bible. The prophet was the word of God. Do you remember I said that last week? So how did you know, since you didn't have the Bible to judge it, if this is going to be? And so Moses had to tell them, if a prophet says something that doesn't come to pass or it doesn't happen, he's not a true prophet. And I told you that in the Old Testament period, when someone prophesied, they wrote it all down. Someone would write it down. And literally, and if you'll notice it in the Old Testament, it's kind of interesting. Did you ever notice that every one of the prophets always had a secretary or an assistant? Did you notice that Elijah had the assistant? Remember when he got in trouble and he ran after and Elijah had an assistant and all of You know why they had an assistant? Because when we went in the open-eyed trance, someone had to record it. And then you would take it when, if you were in the tribe of Judah after the split, you took it to the temple and that's where they put it. And if it didn't come to pass, then they burned the prophecy and they stoned the prophet. So in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophet had to be infallible. But when we get to the New Testament, guess what? We've got the Old Testament. Now some of you are thinking, but we didn't have the New Testament yet. Yes, but the ones who wrote the New Testament were not prophets. They were apostles. That's why it's so important that Paul defends his apostleship. And I will explain in another lesson why they were called apostles rather than prophets, and why the terminology changes in the New Testament. And what you're going to find out is because so many Gentiles were coming inside the church, and it was God's plan to go out in the world, a prophet in the, in the Gentile world was anyone that claimed to have a revelation from God. And it was totally different than what the Jews thought of as an Old Testament prophet. So they had to come up with a completely different word in the New Testament. And that's why Paul has to defend his apostleship, but I'm getting ahead of myself. What I want you to see is, New Testament prophets operated in a different capacity. But here's the key, and this is what I want you to get. What Agabus saw was right, but what he said was wrong. Let me say that again. What Agabus saw, the revelation, what he saw was right, but what he said was wrong. He saw Paul being bound and the Romans carrying off, but he said that the Jews would bind him and turn him over to the Romans. So what he saw was right, but what he said was wrong. And that gives us a clue as to how New Testament prophets operate in this new dispensation of law or dispensation of grace. Agabus received a revelation from God as to what would happen to Paul in the future if he went to Jerusalem, but he spoke it in his own words, which is why it wasn't technically correct. It was close, but it was off when you looked at the details. Why? Because he received this revelation from God. What he saw was right, but because he wasn't going into an open-eyed trance because God didn't put his words into his mouth, but because he simply received this revelation of what he saw was right, he was able to speak it in his own words. And when that happens, there can be fallibility. That's why some of you who've grown up in Assembly of God churches, uh, Pentecostal churches, full gospel churches, you've been around prophecy, it'd be like, uh-huh, 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 someone's prophesying to you. It's like, ooh, that's good, and they get to, ooh, mm, that's not right. And then you wondered if you were new into it. Well, in the Old Testament, they stoned him. Should we stone Sister Clara? Because these parts were right, but this one part was wrong. What happened? Well, they get in the flesh, and they either add to or take away. Because they're given the ability to speak it in their own words. So, what is New Testament prophecy? 
I'm not going to expound on it tonight, but I'm going to give you the keys here. And next week, we're going to go into more in depth what New Testament prophecy is. But what is New Testament prophecy? Well, New Testament prophecy is revelation from God expressed in our own words or in human words. But that's why each little part is to be judged. Because even though that person has received a revelation from God, as Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 14, you get to speak it in your own words. Therefore, each part is to be judged separately. That's also why the person prophesying can wrap it up. Because even though we receive this revelation from God, and he's got this revelation, he's got the freedom to say it in his own words. And that's also why the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. He's not in a trance, people. That's also why it's not equivalent to the Bible, but it's subject to the Bible, and it's judged by the Bible. It's because it's not God's word being spoken through the, th through the prophet. It's revelation from God being spoken in a person's own words. So it's subject to error. So let me ask you this. How many of you have ever operated in the gifts of prophecy? Now, be honest. Surely. Anyone, anyone ever operated in the gifts of prophecy? Oh, come on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Four or five. Thank you. The reason I ask that is I've operated in the gifts of prophecy, and I can tell you how it works. I get a revelation. Sometimes I've seen things, literally see it. And I start prophesying, it's like it's come. I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit on me as I'm prophesying. But I also realize, because I've done it, you add a little bit or you go, ooh, that wasn't quite right the way I said it. Am I right? Am I right? Why? Because when you receive this revelation, you don't go into an open-eyed trance. You're in control of your own spirit. You just receive this revelation. I'll give you several t things when we start looking at this. I'll give you several examples but New Testament prophecy was different than, I shouldn't say was because it still operates today. New Testament prophecy is different than Old Testament prophecy. And the Old Testament prophet is different than the New Testament prophet. And next week we'll go more in depth on the gift of prophecy. But here's what I want you to get because I have four minutes. In the Old Testament, there was no Bible. And a man could come along and say, I'm a prophet of God. And how would you know? So God, to ensure, until the Bible is written, because their words are the Bible, the Holy Spirit would come upon them. They would take control of them. They would go into an open-eyed trance. God would put his words in their mouth. All of them had an assistant. They would record that. Those were supposed to be taken to the king. When the temple was built, it was taken to the temple. It was stored there. If it didn't come to pass, those were burned, and that, sto that prophet was stoned. But that's how you made sure that no error made its way into the Bible. But that's a ha what happened to an Old Testament prophet. The Holy Spirit came upon him, took control of him. He went into an open-eyed trance. God placed his words into their mouth. The New Testament comes along, Jesus Christ has now died for our sins, been resurrected. We're in a new dispensation. Now, there's going to be a change, and I'll talk about that hopefully in three or four weeks. But during this time period, now with these manifestation gifts, people receive a revelation from God. They do not go into an open-eyed trance. They're not completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. They're in control of their own spirit, as Paul writes. But they have received a revelation, and they are able to speak that revelation in their own words. That's why you judge every part. That's why some of you who have received prophecies, you would say, man, that was right on, that was right on, that was right on. That wasn't right at all. And it's a good lesson for those of you who operate in the gift of prophecy. You need to be very careful that you don't try and share more or make sense of what God showed you. Sometimes when I'm prophesying to a person, I'll tell them that's all God showed me. If it doesn't make sense, I'm not going to try and make it make sense. Because that's where we get in trouble. He showed me this, I started saying it, and then to make it make more sense, I added. Okay, hope I haven't thoroughly confused everyone.